founders face mentors and masters. I'm Captain Hawk, CEO of Founderspace, the leading global startup accelerator. I'm also author of the award-winning books, Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, and The Five Horses. I am here today with Dr. Matthew Dunn. He is an interesting guy. He was actually the first person to get a PhD in digital media. He's also the founder of Campaign Genius. He's a writer, director, speaker, inventor. So Matthew, welcome to the show. And can you tell us a little more about yourself and your past? Dog's breakfast of, uh, of a career history, as you already mentioned. I went bounced from being an arts guy to an academic guy to a to a tech guy, I even spent uh, almost nine years at Microsoft and did the PhD. You have seen this huge shift society has taken into the digital realm. Yeah. yeah. And I want to ask you, uh, you've thought a lot about this and what it means. Can you tell us a little about the history of shifting to digital and some key moments that you saw, key decisions, you know, with Microsoft when you're there, with Facebook, yeah. and then we'll go into the future. We have to try and distinguish um, shifts in business and market competition from the larger scale sort of uh, historic, and I hesitate to say technology driven, this is an easy, easy label to stick on it, but, but sort of even, um, even bigger scale than just particular markets. I mean, arguably Facebook, you mentioned, um, did not see TikTok coming. And TikTok's what, two, three years old? Something like that, like unbelievable number of hours and users and so on, um, bam, up out of nowhere. What, what, did they, what did they nail? Well, they nailed a couple of things. One, the appetite for video, which Facebook tried to do, but never quite really got their arms around. I would argue TikTok's video native, where Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat are not video native or video first. TikTok jumped on that. Um, TikTok was, was sort of inherently filter first. Facebook has become that. Facebook was friend first, now arguably it's filter first. TikTok was filter first practically from the get-go, that ingenious set of algorithms that says, ooh, Steven tends to look at this kind of stuff, let's feed him more of this kind of stuff, so we'll get more hours of engagement, and the hamster wheel starts spinning um, super, super fast. So is TikTok gonna supplant Facebook as a dominant monopoly? No way, no way. It's like, it's just the, 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 the numbers aren't there geopolitical uh, geopolitical complications are probably going to play a huge factor as well. There's actually, a, I don't know if it's considered a, f a law in, in a physics department yet, but I read a fascinating book about what what's called the constructal law in physics. And I'll give you the, the gist of it, and this, this ties into our conversation. Um, rivers have a few main branches fed by lots of little streams. Lightning has a big fork with lots of little forks. Markets have that same constructal law structure. And you look at the fangs, right? Facebook, Apple, Google, I forget what the other one is. We see what the big, you know, the big rivers are in digital. And I don't, I, they may change their course, but they're gonna keep the same name for a pretty good long stretch here. Now, it's interesting that TikTok did become such a phenomenon. And it was even before two or three years ago, it was around, but it was in China. So mm -hmm. it was actually, uh, taking off, I remember because I was in China at the time yeah, and yeah. everybody's coming up to me and saying, you should get on TikTok. And they had another name for it in China. And I was like, what? And I looked at it and I was, I thought, wow, this is, this is really going to take off. What people didn't anticipate and Facebook didn't anticipate is it's really hard. Most social networks like in China or South Korea, really hard for them to jump to the U S yes. and, and gain dominance here. And vice versa. T and vice versa, right? Some of that's legal, like walled gardens over there. But you know, <laughs> uh, you know, WhatsApp actually, you know, has right. gone global uh, right. really early on. But um, you know, Chinese didn't really have a social network that made that leap until TikTok. And when it did, it exploded here and, and yeah. had meteoric rise. Now, 
there's going to be other ones. I guarantee you, you know, we've seen clubhouse and the audio side, although clubhouse it's waning. And I saw that too, because it, it requires a high engagement from people. It's not a, a low touch. Like people like social networks when they can get in and get out quickly and do something and check and clubhouse is different. You have to sit around in clubhouse. And I think that's, that's why people are leaving because mm. I honestly, I'm a busy guy. I didn't have time for it. Like I could, it was just sucked way too much time. I tried it out and I was like, this won't go. And that was pretty early on. And I, right, right. I, I stopped investing my time in it. But what I see, you know, there is an opportunity. There will be challengers in this media space, especially mm -hmm. the social media space and around augmented reality. Because, you know, there's been a lot of experiments. Snap has tried it. You know, mm -hmm. Google's tried it. There's been, you know, Samsung, uh, you know, We're on and on and on. on another wave of it, right? New glasses. Yeah. Apple's coming out so. with this new thing. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Yeah, you we'll know, see. We've had so many false starts with that. The problem is it's very difficult to navigate. Like as, as you know, as an expert in digital media, you know, like designing these interfaces. Like I, I have a belief that people want to do something. All of these apps fundamentally tap into things we already want to do. Like we want to see our friends. We want to communicate with our friends. We want to watch cool yeah. viral videos, you know, on TikTok and, yeah. and respond to them. We want to do these. Now, uh, people will always move towards the simplest device and the simplest application to do that. And so far with augmented reality, it hasn't been simple. Like it's not simple and it's not that compelling, right? It's limited in what it can right, do. Right. But there will come a point where we cross that chasm, where we get to the point where this augmented experience, and it could be glasses, but probably not because most people don't want to wear glasses, could be contact lenses. But again, those are still something that a lot of people would resist. It might be brain computer interfaces that right. actually right. allow us right. to you know, augment our, the physical world with digital content. Mm -hmm. And at that point, uh, it could be transformational. We could be moving off our phones and then it's a whole new game. Right. And that one, that one we won't see, we really won't see coming. And that one would be disruptive because really then you're talking about sort of another historical level of change. I, I've got my reservations about, not, not about the, the ethics and the science of direct brain interface. Like if we figure it out, we figure it out. I think we very much underestimate the role the senses play in the mind and vice versa. And the, the sort of groping that we you see companies doing right now uh, to, <laughs> to, to stake out their, their turf in the metaverse at least acknowledges that we'll, we'll probably eventually have digital places that we're that we're living in we will and we can already see this so we are living right now a lot of us a lot of teenagers they're living on instagram they're yeah. living on tiktok yeah. they're yeah. living on you know facebook whatsapp they yeah. are snap they a big part of their lives a big part of their identity is yeah. defined by that digital space and it doesn't matter that it's on a phone yeah. they are still living you know when, when you look at a teenager they're living in it because they're not looking at the outside world they're looking right. at their phone <laughs> so I see a future where that becomes more immersive, whether it's virtual reality or augmented reality. It's going to be we what we I think what we desire is if there's a seamlessness between the physical and digital world, right. that's when suddenly it becomes so compelling. Like when we don't have to try, literally, we could, you know, cha uh, change our environment just by our brainwaves, right? We think, oh, I wanna be in this environment. I wanna have my room look like a jungle. And suddenly it looks like a jungle theme. Maybe we paid for that. Maybe some, you know, some developer made it. It's mm -hmm. jungle themed. I wanna mm -hmm. change my look, how I appear to mm -hmm. other people within mm -hmm. this uh, mutually agreed upon virtual space that we're gonna occupy. Mm -hmm. I think it's gonna be fascinating. Did you see that, uh, it was a short video, but Google, I think Google Labs had a project to do at a, sort of a really heightened version of this kind of conversation, 3D cameras, people behind glass, and, and even the video of the video was, was, was shocking how good it was, how much it looked like those two people were in the same room talking to each other, and all the participants had that same reaction. My God, it was like she was sitting right across the table from me. Did you, did you see that piece? I didn't see that video, but I'll I know what you're... I, you send it to me, and... We'll post it in the show notes for the audience. But 
what I will say is that like right now we're, we're communicating on zoom video. This is fine. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. not the ultimate experience. No, you know, the all. ultimate experience is when I'm sitting with you and you and looks and feels like we're in the same room. Yeah. And as you were saying, our senses, you know, what are our senses, right? It's not just sight. There's touch, there's smell. We have five senses in our body that can and will be stimulated. You know, audio, our brains are black boxes. That's a fact. Like our brain is a black box. It knows nothing about the outside world except for these signals coming in. Right. At some point, and it could be through a brain computer interface right. Right. and other devices, we will be able to recreate these signals coming into our brain. Suddenly, then reality is malleable. Like we could totally start change because you could literally touch a virtual desk and, and send the signal at some point that you feel something and your, you, your hands would actually feel something. Yeah, yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the profs on my, on my PhD committee was a, a gent named Tom Furness, Dr. Tom Furness. Um, he was at the University of Washington Human Interface Technology Lab. Tom is one of the pioneers of VR. And UW had lured him away from the Air Force. This is circa 1989, 1990. They lured him away after 20 plus years developing the cockpit systems in the mm -hmm. Air Force to continue to pursue what he wanted to do with VR. <laughs> And the conversations that we would have about virtual reality then, we're still fighting to figure out how this magnificent brain of ours is is wired into the world. Like it's it's a we'll solve it. I agree with you eventually, but man, it's a complicated problem. It is, and I've been studying brain science too because I'm fascinated because this is where I'm into media, like you are, yeah. digital media, where it's going next, and our the the thing about our brains is they can adapt very easily to new input. Mm -hmm. So they have they have devices out there now that are actually, you can go and buy them that will allow you to literally see through your tongue. And you're like, what are you saying? See through your tongue. They have devices for people who are blind mm -hmm. that they put a little device on their tongue that stimulates their tongue, sends little electric signals gotcha. into their tongue, the yeah, nerves of yeah. their tongue. And because they're blind, yeah. The, the, they have a camera on their head. Yeah. It's capturing these images, sending them through their tongue. It's still yeah. low res, yeah. but they start to see yeah. through those images on their tongue. <laughs> wow. They have other ones. Uh, David Eagleman, he's a really brilliant guy. He developed a vest where people can hear through their back, basically the skin on their back, different yeah. sensations yeah. on their back. They can start to interpret. We will interpret any signal. We Our brains are pattern matching machines, yes, right? They, they will yeah. look for patterns. And, so there are all these new ways that yeah. we can interface with our brain that we haven't even begun to explore. Yeah. And th yeah. that's where it gets amazing. And transformative, not just in a, not just in entertainment and information sense, but in a, you know, a life sense, right? If you are the guy who's visually impaired and you can start to navigate your world through your tongue, right? right? There's wow. a mountain climber who did it. <laughs> he really? climbs mountains navigating through his tongue. Wow, there you go. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, like, I like to hear stuff like that because truthfully, and it's, it was going to happen, right? We race ahead with what will sell to the largest number of people. And then we start playing catch up and fill in, right? Braille was invented well after printed text. Yes. And we're going to see a next generation of entrepreneurs working on how can we take digital media, right? Combine it with all of our senses and create new experiences we never had and potentially even extremely compelling experiences. Mm -hmm. You could imagine if we can simulate touch on the human body and I'm not talking just wearing a haptic glove, right? Because mm -hmm. that's pretty crude, but really touch and different sensations. It could be amazing. Like <laughs> the applications for that wow. in a virtual environment. Yeah. So companies that are uh, experience centric in what they do already seem like logical candidates to start exploring some of that stuff. Yes. Awesome. And we may see it first on the porn sites, honestly. <laughs> you know, I, I joke with people about this, but again, if you look at history, stick the label on pornography, whatever, however you want to define it, right? That's what you, that's what you mean by that. Pornographers are frequently innovators. Yeah. And they they pioneered video. Like yes. they got the whole video thing going. Movies. And even in our digital world, uh, huge, right? A lot of huge. all the kind of marketing techniques that you yep. see out there and you, yep. you, you know this stuff, right? Uh, online, a lot of them were pioneered by those those yeah. sites. I've got a book called uh, 
The Magician in the Cinema by Eric Barno. And same thing, uh, magicians are early exploiters of new realities, right? Magicians were w one of the first group of people to professionally exploit the emergence of cinema. It is amazing. So, so I'm always looking for amazing entrepreneurs who are coming up with these ideas for how to manipulate me, you know, at the intersection of media and technology. Yeah. And it's my firm belief that we've seen a lot, but we're going to see a lot more. That's yeah, just mind boggling coming in the future. Now, I would like to hear from you, your final thoughts on what are some other areas uh, that we'll see a lot of innovation in terms of digital media? Cross your fingers that we'll get as good at using this to learn as we are using it to entertain, right? I mean, there's been an explosion of ed tech because of the pandemic in the past couple of years, but arguably we're just at the beginning of, of really effective forms of, uh, you know, how do you engage content? How do people learn? How do people differ in their ways of learning? Can we utilize all of these things to really be more effective at helping people acquire the knowledge that they need to navigate and work in the world. So one, hopefully that could really blow up schools, right? which would be pretty darn interesting. Yeah. Right now during the pandemic, we've seen a lot of classes move to Zoom, but Zoom has its limitations. The teachers can't track the students. They don't know if they're paying attention, right. really hard to keep them engaged. Right. There has to be something better and there yeah. will be, and it may be AI driven. There may be, uh, it may not be human teachers as there may be an element where the humans interact with humans, but mm. they may be taken through guided interactive AI experiences that are one on one that are yeah. tailored just for the students needs, yeah, just perhaps. at their learning speeds, all these things. And they would combine rich media and everything else. Uh, I think that's coming and that yeah. will change education. Yeah. But I also think we need to be prepared for surprise, right? Learning, learning is a very social activity. I'm sure you had profs. I was grad school in film and television, if I recall right. I'm sure you had profs where you stayed up extra or you spent time extra to get it right or to learn it or to nail the essay. Why? Because of your relationship with them. It's a big driver, right? I, cert I certainly have had that as well. I don't think seeking to remove the the social and relational dimension of education from the process of learning will ultimately work. We just need to figure out how to make those pieces fit together in, in a new and a digital way. Yeah. I agree. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have teachers or student interactions. Those are right. vital. Like we, yeah. people yeah. have to learn how to interact with people, not just machines. So <laughs> we, and, and Amen. people motivate people in a way that machines yes. don't and yes. can't, yes. but there'll be both. It'll be a combination of these artificial environments and uh, potential AI guided experiences and people to people and yeah. different people learn in different ways. There will be those out there who really learn much faster and better at, on their own. Why yep. do they literally, yeah. Yeah. there are those brains out there where they just chug through it on their own at their own speed and in their own way. And then there'll be others who learn much better in a social environment with other people where they're learning together and with a, you know, a human in inter and that human touch and interaction. Do you think we'll keep the patience to engage difficult material? Are we amusing ourselves to death as Neil Postman said? That's a great question. I think, well, definitely people's attention span is shorter. Uh, and how people, you know, and people tend to get interrupted all the time. So it fragments how they learn because there's always some notification going off, some distraction. It, those definitely will have an impact. Will we become dumber or is this the new way of learning to cope with the digital world? That's a question I, I can't answer right now. It's a toughie. It's a toughie. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. You got to be protective of your uh, attention and we're just learning how to do that now. Yeah. I literally turn off all notifications on my devices when I'm concentrating right. and it's the only way for me to get stuff done. Yeah. A and I imagine, you know, other people who really want to produce something that requires deep thinking and extended, you know, time to produce, yeah. they, they do the same thing. They have to. Yeah. So we have, people will be, I think there'll be many different ways of learning and interacting and everybody will be experimenting all the time. And I, I'm not too worried about the dumbing down or the reducing <laughs> right. of attention spans yeah. because people will figure out how to get done what they need to get done. Like right. if right. they're ambitious, if they're goal oriented, they will figure it out and they yeah. will adapt. Yeah. 
Yeah. This uh, this course correct, this jog, this jump six years or so into the future that we've had from from uh, from pan- pandemic work from home, that whole change. I suspect one of the reasons that people aren't articulating it, but I suspect one of the reasons why we're seeing such a strong, no, 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 I'm really, I'm fine working from home, boss. I want to keep doing that is a little more control over those circumstances to achieve. It's, it's a lot easier to get than it would be in a cubicle farm, isn't it? People aren't interrupting you. There's not constant distractions when you're in your home. So I talked to my brother. He, When the pandemic started, he's a programmer. And when the pandemic started, he was really upset because he he needed that social interaction. Oh, wow. And he yeah. felt like I'm he got depressed. I'm all alone. I can't interact with people. Yeah, it's it's I, I how long is this going to go on <laughs> now today that yeah. we've been in this pandemic for quite some time? Yeah, he is like he was worried up until just recently that he'd get sent back to work. He was like, I don't want to go back. I got used to this. It's so much better. I'm go. saving an hour and a half on my commute. Right. I'm. I'm much more productive. If I yeah. get exhausted during the day, I can yeah. lie down and take a power nap. Right, nobody's right, nobody's right. going to say anything. Right. And I can and I can go, you know, I can get chores done in between when I yeah. when I need a break. He's just like does not want to so go back to work. And his company just said because you're a programmer, none of the programmers have to come back. Only the managers. So he was like, "Yes." <laughs> um I work in I work much in the same way. Sounds like you do as well. I'm guessing you have to have plenty of of, of time with your team face to face. Um, what do you think we'll lose from the office? We do lose that human interaction uh, on a daily basis. So people will still get together, but it's not. You know, there's a lot of serendipitous conversations. Yeah. that happen when you're in a space. Yeah. You don't really get to know people when you're online because you talk to them about business, but you don't just hang around the water cooler yeah. or you know, you don't go for walks, you don't go out to lunch together. Yeah. And that's where the real bonding yeah. and the real connection happens. So and trust and all these things. So those won't be there. And mm-hmm. they it's going to be very I don't with today's technology, I we can't seem to get there. And that is a shame because uh, I say being at work isn't just being at work and getting work done. It is part of life, part of who right. you are. Right. And and a lot of the relationships at work won't be the same. Like they, you won't really know those people. You will know what they can do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you'll know, you, you'll get stuff done together, but you won't have that same uh, connection to them. I fundamentally agree with you. But interestingly enough, I entered a new uh, a new market space right before the pandemic hit the uh, the email space where campaign genius operates and in the past what not quite two years i've actually grown a lot of what i consider to be personal relationships and i've never met these folks it's been tons of zoom time sometimes group sometimes one-to-one lots of you know business interaction email whatever you know email uh, slack and stuff like that but I'm surprised at the degree to which I regard that set of people as as valued colleagues. And I haven't actually been in a room, had a beer, had lunch with almost any of them. Is that the same thing as if I were in an office with them? No, to your point. But it's intriguing that it can work to some degree. Yeah, shift to video because that makes a huge difference. Yeah. And also... You know, you're getting stuff done with these people. There is that interaction. You yeah. are, yeah. and you get to know their personalities, yeah. and, you know, how they work, how they think. Yeah. Um, you just don't have that kind of downtime with them. You know, if you're with somebody and you're just sitting around like you're in a taxi or in a hotel, a hotel lobby or, you know, in the in your company and you just stop by their desk, it's yeah. it's still different. No, I totally <laughs> agree. And and that 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 human level breaking bread or or having a beer together. Yes. Like that's not trivial. That's a really big deal. We're just taking those moments outside the office with our friends and family and things like that. We're doing that and we'll continue to do that. And we just, they're, they're not combined in the workplace. Right. They're, right. they're separate. So it's not like we miss them because we have other relationships where we yeah. have that. Yeah. Tough, tough burden on people who, um, who either don't have those or don't have the, um, opportunities to build those right i i worry that i worry that there are a lot of there are a lot of people quite crushed about loneliness yeah people who are more isolated yeah who don't have that real 
outside friend social network yeah, in the real yeah, real world, yeah. they um, I imagine there's a piece missing from their life. Yeah. I mean, the guy the guy who was, you know, guy or gal who was annoying at work because they really wanted to chit chat with you. That may have been a lifeline for them in, from a relationship perspective. Work may have been the place where they had the most of a of a of a of a circle of relationships. So hmm. we're going to wrap this up now. Deal. I want to thank you, Dr. Dunn, for, for being with us today, for sharing your thoughts, for having a great conversation. And I want you to tell our audience how they can find you and and on social networks, your website, everything else. Well, website's easy. Campaign Genius, all one word, dot I-O. Uh, social networks, uh, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. Just search Matthew Dunn. Uh, I, I have actually been weaning myself off most other social networks for that attention and concentration thing that you and I touched on, like, I don't have time for Twitter. <laughs> so LinkedIn is kind of the, 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 the main collegial contact and then the uh, you know business address already rattled off there. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you liked it, hit the subscribe button and share it with your friends. You can help us create more great content by subscribing and sharing. Also, if you want to access our online startup program, our investor network, and our entrepreneur resources, just come to founderspace.com.